You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Parsha Review Podcast. All right, welcome back everybody to the weekly Parsha Review. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Re'e. Re'e is the fourth portion in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Devarim, and the 47th portion since the beginning of the Torah. We have 126 verses, 1,932 words, and 7,442 letters. And again this week, we repeat these numbers because it is critically important for us to remember that the Torah doesn't have an extra letter, not an extra word, not an extra verse. If it's there, it's there for a reason, and it's important for us to learn. And we're going to see today a few examples of why things are mentioned either in a duplicitous fashion, or if there's a verse that was previously mentioned in the Torah, why why does it need to be repeated? These are points we're going to see. And there are 55 mitzvahs in this week's parsha, 17 performative mitzvahs, and 38 prohibitions. So last week in Parshas Ekev, Moshe emphasized the vital importance of observing the mitzvahs as the key to the survival and success of the Jewish people. That was mentioned last week, and this week again it's going to be reiterated and re-emphasized again by its importance, its, its essential ingredient to Jewish success. You want to know Jewish continuity? We want to understand the secret of the Jewish people? It's in this week's Parsha. Now, Moshe presents, and this is the way the Parsha begins, See, I am putting before you two choices. Moshe presents two choices before the Jewish people. Blessing and curse. It's your choice. Following the word of Hashem will result in tremendous blessing. The curse, however, will befall those who don't heed Hashem's command and distance themselves and follow other gods. And we mentioned previously that following other gods doesn't mean bowing down to idolatry. It's anything that we give importance to that distracts us, removes us from our focus and connection to Hashem. When you enter the promised land, you will declare the blessings on Mount Grizim and the curses on Mount Evol. As we'll see, the Jewish people were divided up into two separate groups. One was on one mountain, Har Grizim, and they announced the blessings. And the other was on Mount Evol, and they announced the curses for those who follow or do not follow the command of Hashem. Moshe continues to guide the nation on what to do upon conquering and inheriting the land. Number one, when you arrive in the land of Canaan, destroying the idols, break their idolatrous altars, smash their pillars, burn their sacred trees, and cut down their carved images, their statues, and obliterate their names from the land. Hashem has a disdain for idolatry. And because these nations that we're going to conquer the land of Israel from are idolators, Hashem commands us here in this week's parsha that when we take over the land, remove all remnants of their idolatry. Next, the temple. We are commanded to only bring offerings in the one designated location that Hashem chooses, where the divine presence will dwell and never on a private altar. You see, in the desert... The Jewish people, as they were traveling, would assemble the altar and they would serve it there. They would serve whatever offerings they were bringing to Hashem there, wherever it was. But now, because you're entering into the land of Israel, only bring an offering in the designated place that Hashem decides. Kosher meat. We are permitted to eat meat from the redeemed offerings that is properly slaughtered. It's a very important point here it must be properly slaughtered and we are prohibited against eating the blood of any animal a kosher animal as well which is why as we'll see soon we have the salting process that removes and extracts all the blood from the animal sacred food tithes second tithes firstborn animals vow offerings which is peace offerings and thanksgiving offerings and Bikurim, which are the gifts that are brought to the temple, to Jerusalem, must be consumed only in the location Hashem chooses. And that is 
Jerusalem, like we mentioned previously, only in those locations to bring offerings. It's referring to Jerusalem where the temple stood. And additionally, for 369 years, there was a temporary temple in Shiloh. And that was a designated place that Hashem said, temporarily, you can bring offerings here. Do what is good and right in the eyes of Hashem, and it will forever be good for you and your family. This is a promise given in chapter 12, verse 28. Do what is good and right in the eyes of Hashem, and it will forever be good for you and your and your family and all of your generations. Moshe warns against copying the ways of the nations. We learn this in Halacha, the importance of distinguishing ourselves from the nations of the world. The Torah is perfect. And here is a command in the Torah, chapter 13, verse 1. Do not add or subtract to the mitzvahs, the commands of the Torah. Don't add and don't subtract. We had this last week as well. We talked about this in Parshas Akev. We'll talk about it a little bit more today. Bad influences. We are cautioned about false prophets and dreamers. Don't listen to them and don't follow them. Kill them. A person who tries to entice others to sin and go astray should also be stoned to death. An apostate city. If a city becomes spiritually corrupt with idolatry, investigate them well, and if they are guilty of going against Hashem, kill all the inhabitants and gather all the booty in the city center and burn it all completely. Here is an important verse, chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Three verses. We are Hashem's children. Banim atem la Hashem elokechem. You are children. We are called children to Hashem. We need to be distinguished. We are holy and we are chosen. Okay, this is something we shouldn't be shy about. This is something we shouldn't be embarrassed about. It's something we should be proud of. Something we should feel a sense of responsibility to this incredible, incredible, I don't want to call it a burden, but this, this is a, 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 a burden that Hashem is putting on us. You're not like the nations of the world. All the nations of the world, they can act how they act. They do what they do. The Jewish people, we need to be different. And the Torah commands us to be different. Not to blend in, not to assimilate, not to just be like everyone else. That's not what Hashem wants us to do. We are forbidden from mourning like the nations of the world by cutting our skin and balding our hair. What they used to do is they used to cut their hair between their eyes and they used to cut themselves in a, as a sign of mourning. And we know that this isn't the proper thing to do. The Torah tells us it is forbidden. we're forbidden from doing so. We learn about the laws of kosher again. The list of kosher and non-kosher animals, fish, birds, and their qualifications are mentioned again. If you remember back in Leviticus 11, we mentioned this previously. And we'll see soon that it, there's a very few changes to what was written previously. And it's not a change. It's only additions, things that are more descript in this iteration of the laws of kosher. Additionally, the Torah prohibits us from eating milk and meat. They may not be mixed by way of cooking, eating, or deriving any benefit from this mixture. Tithes, all produce must be tithed. Each year, they should be taken and eaten in Jerusalem. If the quantity is too large to bring to Jerusalem, it can be exchanged for money with which food is bought in Jerusalem and eaten there. Every third year, the tithe is left at the gates for the Levites, the converts, the orphans, and the widows to eat and enjoy. Shemitah. We know we have the sabbatical year, but additionally, in this week's Parsha, we learn that we are instructed to forgive all loans on the Shemitah year. There's a mitzvah to loan money, and there's a mitzvah to forgive the loans that are not repaid by the Shemitah, by the sabbatical year. And there's a special promise that you won't lose out from it. Hashem is the one who gives money. Hashem is the one who disperses to everyone their livelihood. And there's a promise that by loaning money, you won't lose money. We are taught how to properly treat poor people, be kind-hearted and open-handed. Jewish slaves must be released after six years by the Shemitah, 
and send them off generously with gifts, the Torah tells us. If they desire to remain slaves, and this was mentioned back in Parshas Mishpatim in Exodus, if they decide that they want to remain slaves, their ear is pierced by the mezuzah and they remain enslaved forever until the Jubilee. All firstborn male cattle are holy and are to be offered on the temple. Their meat is eaten by the Kohen. And then the Parsha concludes with the three pilgrimages, the three festivals where the Jewish people are commanded to go up to Jerusalem and bring their offerings. And those are the holiday of Passover, the, uh, the holiday of Shavuos, and the holiday of Sukkot. These festivals are reviewed at the end of the Parsha. And now, my dear friends, let's turn our attention to some of the important lessons from this week's Parsha. So it's very interesting the way the Parsha begins and tells us of what will happen if a person does not abide by the commands of the Torah. And it's it's a little striking. When I looked at it, it was like very striking that the Torah doesn't say, well, this may be the result. No. It says the following. Vehaklala and the curse, im lo sishmu el mitzvos Hashem alokechem, if you don't listen to the commands of Hashem your God, visartem anaderch, and you will stray from the path that I command you today, asher anochi mitzav eschem ayom, you will stray, that's a guarantee, lo lechas achrei alakim orchem, and you're going to go after other gods, asher lo yodatem, which you're not to know of. I think it's very important for us to realize that we cannot let our spirituality be up to chance. Hashem is telling us here a very clear ingredient. We follow Hashem's command, we're guaranteed incredible blessing. We are also guaranteed that if, God forbid, we decline to follow the command of Hashem, you know what the guarantee is? You're going to go astray, you're going to serve other gods, you're going to disappear. It is something that we need to understand. There's a cause and effect in this world. We know there's the laws of gravity. Do the laws of gravity ever change? No, they don't ever change. There are also laws we learn in this week's Parsha of spiritual gravity. Where if a person is connecting to Hashem, what happens? They float up like the fire. The fire is the only thing that defies gravity. That's why the Torah is compared to fire. Because it elevates you. It goes up. Whereas, if God forbid a person distances themselves from the mitzvahs, from the commands of the Torah, what happens? It's like gravity. It drops down. It falls to the lowest place possible. And this is something that we need to reinstill in ourselves constantly. This is why we read the Torah every single year. Why? Why is it important to read the Torah, the entire Torah, every single year? Because we as Jewish people, as human beings, we are forgetful. And we need to be reminded every year to strengthen ourselves, to reaffirm our commitment to Hashem. And that's why this week's Parsha is a perfect time. We're about, in a few weeks, we're going to be standing on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, in our synagogues, and asking for another great year. For what? Because we want to have a connection to Hashem. So it's timed in a time, in a timely location in our calendar so that we can focus properly onto what's important in our lives. The next important verse I want to pull out is chapter 12, verse 18. And it says that you can only bring offerings in the place that Hashem des- decides and that Hashem determines is the, pro- the proper place, which we know is going to be the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and for a few temporary 369 years in Shiloh and Shiloh. But what does it say about the offerings that you're going to bring? And you shall rejoice before Hashem, your God, in your every undertaking. There's a special commandment to be rejoicing in our service of Hashem. To not just serve Hashem. To not just, oh, I have to go pray. Oh, I have to observe Shabbos. 
Oh, I have to keep kosher. Oh, what can I do? Nebuch. Oh, it's so sad. You know, Reb Moshe Feinstein, who was the leading Torah scholar in the United States until he passed away in 1986, he knew all of Torah. He knew all of Mishnah. He knew all of Talmud. He knew all of the Midrash. And he reviewed it regularly. They say that he finished the Shas, the Talmud, over 400 times. Every single Shabbos he would conclude and he would learn the entire tractate of Shabbat, which is one of the most difficult and one of the longest tractates in all of Talmud. What an amazing Torah scholar. And you look at his response, it is thorough. It is exquisite in its sources from everywhere to learn practical halacha for questions that come up in our modern generation today. Ramosha Feinstein once said that the following terminology did more damage to American Jewry than anything else. Is that when Jews came to America, they were losing their jobs because they wouldn't work on Shabbos. And they'd get a pink slip every Sunday morning. They'd come back to work. They're like, sorry, you're fired. You weren't here yesterday. You're fired. And people started using a term that was very derogatory about their own Judaism. And that term is, in Yiddish, it's difficult to be a Jew. Reb Moshe Feinstein said, those words alone did more destruction for the Jewish people than anything else. Because that is everything against this verse. We have to understand, although there may be times that it's very difficult, and it's challenging, the state of a Jew is always, it is awesome to be a Jew. It's, in Yiddish, gishmak to be a Jew. It's awesome to be a Jew. It's delightful to be a Jew. Are there challenges? Of course there are challenges. But the state of a Jew needs to be v'samachta. You have to be joyful. That is the command. Hashem wants us to be happy. Hashem wants us to be in a life filled with pleasure, with joy. That's the state. And that we see in this verse where Hashem is guiding us to how he wants us to serve him, with joy. You do a mitzvah, don't just do it. Think about it. Contemplate, what's this mitzvah that I'm about to do? How does this bring me closer to Hashem? And recognize with happiness that this is the purpose of our creation. Even the simple mundane, quote, mitzvahs. The simple mitzvahs. They're not simple mitzvahs. These are tools, like we mentioned time and again. Every mitzvah is a tool to bring us closer to Hashem. Every sin, every time there's a a prohibition in the Torah, that prohibition, if we disobey that prohibition, a prohibition keeps us from distancing ourselves from God. When the Torah tells us, don't eat those foods, what it's telling you that those foods are going to distance you from your source. They're going to clutter your spiritual channels and you're not going to be able to connect. So the prohibitions are to keep us and protect us. That's the defense from falling away from our connection. The mitzvahs say the the, the performative commandments are the ones that proactively are there are offense. They're the ones that bring us closer to Hashem. You can't score points on defense, right? A baseball team is out in the field and they're playing defense. They can't score points. But when you're hitting, that's when you can score points. That's our offense versus our defense. Our defense limits the damage, limits our distancing from Hashem. The fundamental, the key to our service of Hashem is joy. If we don't have joy, we don't have the ability for God's presence in our life. The Talmud says, in a place of sadness, in a place of depression, God's presence cannot reside. Only in a place of joy. And that's from this verse. We have to figure it out. We have to find a way to connect with our mitzvahs. Whatever size mitzvah we're observing, even lighting the Shabbos candles, Take a moment before you light those Shabbos candles. 
what am I doing here? I'm not just doing a ritual. Judaism is not about rituals. The mitzvah that I'm about to perform is to bring light into my home, to bring the light of Hashem into my family, to add romance to my life, to add a, a to make this sanctuary a place which is filled with light. It's a different experience. If we just take a moment before we do our mitzvahs, not to just do them out of habit, but to do them with focus, with intention, that will bring tremendous joy. Then the Torah continues, chapter 12, verse 28, do what is good and right in the eyes of Hashem. And then later on it says, don't copy the ways of the nations. So, you know, we always, we're living in a generation today where everyone wants their independence. I want to do my thing. I want to live my life the way I live my life. That's great. There's plenty of room for independence in Judaism. We see all of these different streams of observant Jews who are following the commands of the Torah, and they look uniquely different. They're all observing the same Shabbos, putting on tefillin every day, learning Hashem's Torah, but they look different. That's fine. You can have different styles. Don't forget we had 12 different tribes. They all had different flags. They were uniquely different, but yet the same. What kept them the same? Follow the will of Hashem. Follow the will of Hashem. It's something important for us to stress that sometimes the thing that Hashem wants us to do, for whatever reason, it doesn't, doesn't fit with the, my worldview. We can, I don't want to pick any of the modern day politically triggered topics, but think of anyone and think of what Hashem says in his Torah to do or not to do. You're like, well, that doesn't fit with my perspective on this world. That doesn't fit with my politics. That doesn't fit with my value system. And this is the real question. Whose values are more accurate? Ours or Hashem's? Hashem is the creator of heaven and earth. Hashem is the one who is just, who is truth, who is all-knowing. Versus us, we're filled with emotions, we're filled with preconceived ideas of how things should or should not be. Who's right? Is it possible that the way of Hashem is the proper way? Is it possible that maybe I don't have my hand properly on what is true, on what is just, on what is the right way to live life? Who goes first, me or Hashem? Is it my way that's the right way? Or is it perhaps Hashem's way that's the right way? And this is a question that's important for us to think about. This week's Parsha, the Parsha says what is right in the eyes of Hashem. It doesn't say what's right in your eyes. What's right in the eyes of Hashem. You know what? I may have a great desire to eat a cheeseburger. But Hashem says it's not the right thing to do. Don't do it. Is it right in my eyes? I don't see what the problem is. It's not right in the eyes of Hashem. So who's going to win? This is the struggle. Who wins that tug of war? Is it us or Hashem? Do we do what's right in my eyes or do we do what's right in the eyes of Hashem? And you know what? Maybe if I don't see things eye to eye with Hashem, I need to connect myself more to Hashem. Maybe if I don't see things eye to eye with Hashem, it's a flaw in me, not in Hashem. Hashem is, Hashem is not archaic. Hashem is not, you know, ancient, old-fashioned. Hashem is the living God today. Around back 3,300 years ago when the Torah was given, when the creation of the world was, all of the science, look, we're today operating 
you're sitting wherever you're sitting around the world, watching this presentation, listening on a podcast, and everything we're doing is through the waves. Where were those waves from? Who created those waves? Their internet waves, their sound waves. Where do they come from? Guess what? 5,783 years ago, when God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day of creation, all of those waves already existed. Hashem created all of that already. Now, we haven't discovered it yet, but it was all there in creation already. You think Hashem doesn't know a thing or two about modern society? About modern technology? He created it. For us to assume that we know what's right and not Hashem, that's archaic. That's old-fashioned. We need to understand that Hashem's will is the will we need to follow. And that's the command in this week's parsha. Now, just a quick refresher on the laws of kosher that we mentioned back in Leviticus 11. And that is that any livestock need to have two characteristics to be kosher. They have to have split hooves and they have to chew their cud. And those are, you may eat the ox, the sheep, the goat, the heart, the deer, the achmur, the ako, the dishon, the tail, and the zamer. Every animal that has split hoof and chews its cud. That's from the verse in this week's parsha. The Torah tells us exactly the animals that we may eat. What about the exceptions? Are there any animals that have one sign but not the other, that they either have split hooves and don't chew their cud, or chew their cud and don't have split hooves? There are four exceptions. Three, the camel, the hyrax, and the rabbit, they chew their cud but do not split hooves. And the pig has split hooves but does not chew its cud. And then it also says that we shouldn't even touch the carcass of a non-kosher animal. Non-kosher animals don't even touch the carcass of a non-kosher animal. And another thing is that we can't eat from any of those kosher animals if they're not properly slaughtered. So just a quick thing here. Before we get onto the fish, the birds, the insects, is there any place in the Torah that tells us how to slaughter an animal. Torah says to slaughter an animal before you eat it. Kosher animal, take your ox, slaughter it properly, and then you can eat it. Don't eat the blood. It's a commandment in this week's parsha. Does it say any place how to slaughter the animal? No place. The entire Torah. We have to understand something. In the Torah, it only says what to do, not how to do. It says to put a mezuzah on your door. It doesn't say what a mezuzah is. It doesn't say what side of the door. It doesn't say any details. It says to wear tefillin. It doesn't say what tefillin are. It says to slaughter the animal. It doesn't tell us how to. And there are many, many, many other mitzvahs that it says what to do, but it doesn't say how to do, how to perform them. That's what the oral Torah is for. Moshe orally described every detail of the Torah to Aaron, to Joshua, to all of the elders, to the tribe leaders, to the prophets. And this was written down later in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, in the Midrash. We need to understand that the oral Torah and the written Torah are linked together. You cannot understand a word of the written Torah without the oral Torah. And you can't understand a word of the oral Torah without the written Torah. They're linked. And cannot be separated. So why weren't they given together? That's a question for another time. Primarily, the main reason is that we have a Masorah. is so that you have a teacher to learn from, to connect the dots for you, with you so that you understand how to learn things. And that's very important in Judaism. We don't go out on our own, as we'll see. The Torah tells us that we shouldn't 
follow a false prophet or a dreamer. We'll see that's Christianity and Islam. One is the false prophet and the other is the dreamer. That's in this week's Parsha. Okay. Now, Torah also tells us in our refresher, fish, what type of fish can we eat? In this week's Parsha, we learn again that only a fish with fins and scales. A kosher fish has fins and easily removable scales, and there cannot be a fish with scales without fins. If it has scales, it has fins. Okay. Fowl, there are, I believe, 24 different birds that we cannot eat, that are prohibited from of our eating. And they're listed here. Uh, we're not going to go through them, but basically the eagle, the, the crow, the raven, these aggressive birds are not to be eaten. And another very important thing, we don't need any insects, any creepy crawlers. Those are out. All right, there are some forms of grasshoppers that are kosher. We don't know what they are. We lost the misora in that. We lost the tradition of that. And therefore, we don't need any of the creepy koalas. But it's very important for us to understand that before meat, kosher meat, goes through a more rigorous process than non-kosher meat. After it's slaughtered, it is soaked, and then it is salted, and then it is rinsed. And that's why I'm sure you've seen in stores kosher salt. It's more coarse. It's bigger salt. That's what they use to salt all the chicken, all of the, uh, all of the meat that we eat. Kosher meat, kosher, uh, poultry is all salted before it is pre- ready for us. Now, it used to be when my mother was, my mother's not that old, but when my mother was in school, that was one of the things that they had to learn in school. You learn mathematics. You learn science and you learn how to kosher a a, a chicken. That was part of the education. They had to learn how to do that. Today, you buy it already packed. It's packed from Meal Mart or from one of the uh, chicken meat processors. And they already have a whole conveyor belt of rabbis and uh, people who are washing, rinsing, soaking, uh, doing everything properly so that our meat is not only slaughtered properly, but prepared for us and ready for us to consume. So it's important for us to remember we are not allowed to eat the blood of an animal. Okay. Now, there are three mentions in the Torah that say and command us not to eat milk and meat together. Three times in the Torah. And we mentioned at the beginning of class today that there's a specific number of verses, specific number of words, a specific number of letters in the Torah. Why would the Torah repeat the same commandment three times? And the Talmud asks this question. Our sages teach us that this teaches us three separate laws regarding milk and meat. Number one is you can't eat milk and meat together. Number two is you cannot cook milk and meat together. And number three, you can't derive pleasure or benefit from milk and meat together. That's why it says it three times in the Torah. And this is brought down in the Talmud and confirmed in the Halacha that these three times in Exodus, it says it twice in chapter 23, verse 19, chapter 34, verse 26, and here in Deuteronomy, in our parsha, chapter 14, verse 21, it's repeated a third time. Three times, it only needs to say it once. Well, to teach us three different things. And that's why it says it three times. If the Torah says something a second time, it's there for a reason. We're going to give you another example for that. It says in this week's parsha, chapter 14, verse 22, Aser to aser. Tithe, you shall tithe. Just tell me tithe. What do you need to tell me a second time? You shall tithe. We know there's not an extra word in the Torah. It seems to be duplicitous. It seems to be unnecessary for it to be repeated again. Our sages teach us, why does it say it twice? Because it's giving you a hint 
to the blessing of tithing. Aser kedei shetit asher. The reason why it says it the second time is to tell you that when someone gives a tithe and they're careful about their tithing, it's a blessing for wealth. That's why it says it. It doesn't really mean that you read it with the same vowels, aser ta aser, but rather aser kedei shetit asher. You tithe, it's a blessing for enormous wealth. When someone is meticulous and someone is careful about their tithing, there's a promise embedded in the Torah of the reward that will that is guaranteed. So we see that there's no extra verse. There's no extra letter in the Torah. If it's there, it's there for a reason. Okay, now let's get to the false prophets and dreamers. So there are two qualifications for a false prophet. Number one is they relay prophecy from an idol, from a false god. Or they say that God told them that the Jews can violate a mitzvah. So number one is that if you look at Christianity and you look at Islam, they both had their leader, whoever they say is their god or their their idol, is someone, Muhammad had a dream, that God came and said that he's the chosen one now, no, no longer the Jews. And the other was Jesus, where he proclaims that he had a prophecy. These two are mentioned in our Torah portion. To be careful. And you know what? Put them to death for going against Hashem. So, if someone were to ask you if we killed their God or their idol, you can turn them to this week's Torah portion and tell them we have a commandment to do so. We don't know historically if we did or didn't, but it's definitely written in this week's parsha as a commandment to do so. But what's the idea over here? What's the idea behind this? Oh, we have a problem with the dreamer. We have a problem with Joseph was a dreamer. We have a problem with a prophet. We don't have a problem with a prophet. What's the problem? The problem is, is that then it becomes an individual's tell of what should or should not be. The Jewish people are a lot smarter than that. We need to have something which we can all admit and all agree happened in front of all of us. Moshe, and no place in the Torah does Moshe say, take my word for it because God told me privately that such should be done. Never happened. You don't find it anywhere in the Torah. The revelations were a public revelation to the entire people. When God was talking to Moshe, the voice was heard, overheard, outside of the tent of meeting. The presence of Hashem was seen by all. There was no secrets. There's no individual revelation. It's a public revelation. That's what makes us unique, so that we know the Torah that we have today is true. It's Torah's emes. It's a Torah of truth. It's not an individual's tell. It's not an individual's revelation. It's a public revelation that was given to the entire people. And that's one of the reasons why Judaism doesn't threaten anyone with death if you don't follow Judaism. You can be a non-Jew. You can be a, a Gentile that gets heaven. You don't need to accept the Torah. You don't need to follow, you know, keep Shabbos and put on tefillin every day if you're not Jewish. You'll still go to heaven. Do the commands that Hashem does tell you, which is the seven Noahide laws. Denounce the idols. You get a perfect place in the world to come. You don't have to be Jewish for that. Which is why we discourage people from converting. We say, why would you do that? You can go to heaven free without all the burdens of kosher, and Shabbos, and all the things that are perceived burdens. Don't forget their joys. You can get to heaven without it. You have your place in heaven without it. 
You don't need to convert to Judaism in order to get your place in the world to come. That the other nations don't have. There's no other nation on planet Earth that says, if you don't follow us, you got a perfect place. If you're not a a Christian, if you're not ready to bow down to the cross and take your leap of faith, eternal damnation. Go to hell. And what happens if a person doesn't believe in Islam? We're going to wage a jihad against you, you infidel. No such concept in Judaism. In Judaism, we say you can be great the way you are. We have the seven Noahide laws, and that's it you need to do. Okay, so another thing is that we have two more pieces here. Just hold on tight. I know we're going a little long today, but it's it, these portions are so rich with messages and 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 incredible, incredible connection to Hashem. We can't just uh, shortcut this. The offerings that we're commanded to bring only in Hashem's chosen place, they demonstrate that you can't just do what you want in your service of Hashem. What does that mean? We need to be subservient to the will of Hashem. You see, Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron Akoin, our high priest, they were so excited to serve Hashem. So what did they do? They ran into the Holy of Holies and brought their offerings. And what happened? They died. They were killed by Hashem. A heavenly force came and took them. Why? It doesn't go your way. It goes Hashem's way. We need to have a subservience to Hashem. You know, this whole concept of feeling missing out. I'm missing out. I want to do it my way. And, and you know, this, this, there is a no compromise in Judaism. There's a no compromise in Judaism. I know we mentioned last week and mentioned hundreds of times in our classes that it's not an all or nothing proposition. Judaism is not about all or nothing. And it isn't. We take a step, but we don't compromise the Torah. Don't change the rules of the Torah. Don't change the laws and bend them to how I want them. Well, it's inconvenient for me to go to Jerusalem and to bring my offering there. I'll just bring my offering wherever I am. No, that's idolatry. (laughs) I'm doing it for Hashem. No, it's idolatry. You're doing it because this is what's comfortable for you. You're bringing the Torah down to you instead of elevating yourself to it. And that needs to be the direction we go is we elevate ourselves to Jerusalem. It's symbolic of us being subservient to Hashem and bringing ourselves to Hashem, not pulling Hashem down to us. And we need to measure the way we interact with Hashem. Are we bringing ourselves, elevating ourselves to Hashem? Or are we pulling Hashem down to us? The former is the way in which we're commanded in this week's parsha. You bring yourself to Hashem. Don't chisel away at Hashem and try to bring Him down to you. That's the mistake of modernity. It's great, this whole idea, the concept of being a modern Jew today. Observing the Torah fervently, but living in a modern world. Being able to interact with the world, understanding technology, utilizing technology, understanding science, utilizing science. The problem with modernity is that what many people have done is gotten too comfortable with our American lives. And you know what? I'll do what fits into my schedule and I'll pull the Torah down to me and make it somehow work for me. Instead of being committed completely to Hashem and elevating myself to Hashem, yes, the great gifts that Hashem has given us in our modern world, utilize them, but they shouldn't make us complacent 
They shouldn't make us rebellious. They shouldn't make us too comfortable and too complacent where we're not willing to elevate ourselves to Hashem. We have to see that it's not a two-way street in the sense that, oh, over here I'll push myself up to Hashem, but here I'll pull him down because over here it's comfortable for me. And over here it's not comfortable for me. And it goes by my whims. Torah tells us, don't make idolatry. Things that are symbols of idolatry don't either make. So if you think of the Hanukkah bush, what is that? What is the Hanukkah bush? That's the idea of I'm going to pull the culture, put godliness, pull him down to me instead of elevating ourselves to Hashem. Hashem says not to do that. Hashem commands us in this week's parasha, do not destroy their idols, burn their idols. No remnants of it. Get rid of all of it. Now that doesn't mean we have to go to people's homes and burn their burn down their Xmas bushes, but definitely not to try to emulate them and Jewify it. Don't try to bring God down. Don't pull God down. This is what we're commanded in this week's parsha. Elevate yourself instead to Hashem. Let Hashem be your anchor and you connect to Hashem. And finally, we see that there are mitzvahs that are given in this week's parsha that set us apart from the nations of the world. We're distinguished, we're different, we're elevated because of these unique mitzvahs. We have the laws of kosher, we have the laws of tithes. We have the laws of Shemitah. We have the laws of lending. We have the laws of how to treat a slave. You're sending your slave free and you have to send them off with gifts? Who heard of such a thing? Yet, you know why? Think of the emotional part of this. Not only that, in this week's parsha it tells us how to treat a poor person. The Torah tells us, Deimach Soro. Do you know what true Charity is not what you want to give, but what they're lacking, we learn in this week's Parsha. What are they lacking? Yeah, could be they're lacking food to eat. They're lacking something else, perhaps. But what's about their dignity? Are they lacking their dignity from where they used to be? That means if you had someone who was the CEO of a big company, Yeah, people would come knocking on his door all the time for charity. And then the company went bankrupt. He lost all his money. And now he has to take public transportation. He's not only missing money. He's missing status. He used to have the Rolls Royce, the Bentley. He used to have the drivers taking him. And now what does he have? He has to go public transportation. The humiliation. Oh, you should learn. Torah is very sensitive to that. The Torah teaches us it's more than just giving someone food to eat. It's recognizing their status. Go to their emotional level. Giving is not only a physical task. It's connecting with their emotional needs. And this is what we're commanded in our Torah. To be a level above the ordinary. And then we have the mitzvahs of the firstborns. And then we have the mitzvahs of the festivals. These are all things that distinguish us from the nations. My dear friends, if there's one thing that we learn from this week's parsha, is that we need to be proud. We need to walk around with a joy that we are the chosen people. Not to heaven forbid feel like, oh, I don't want people to know that I'm Jewish. Maybe I shouldn't wear my yarmulke. Maybe I should hide my tzitzis. Walk around with pride. People should know that you're Jewish. How? By the way you walk around. People should see, oh, that's a Jew. They're kind. They'll let someone walk in front. Sure, no problem. They'll be generous with people. They'll be 
gracious on the roads. They won't road rage. They won't get, get angry. They'll let other drivers in. Ah, oh, that's a Jew. That's what the nations of the world should see in us. We should be a light unto the nations. This means that we should be an example for the nations. That people should look at us and say, ah, these are Hashem's people. Hashem should bless us all with an amazing Shabbos. And God willing, we should all merit to be at the level where we feel this connection with Hashem, His Torah, His mitzvahs in everything that we do. Amen. Good Shabbos.